Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio. I'm here live with James Jacob Prash in England. Uh, Jacob, one of the believers asked, what does it mean to worship the starry host or the host of heaven? And that's in Zephaniah 1.5. Okay, the term in Zephaniah 1.5, or the term for the host of heaven, is Sebaot HaShamayim. Sebaot HaShamayim. And it is essentially <coughs> the Hebrew term for armies. Armies. The Lord of hosts is the Lord of the armies of heaven. Because we see angelic warriors in the book of Revelation and in the book of Daniel, he is the Lord of the angelic warriors, Sevaot. Adonai Elohim Sevaot, Lord God of the heavenly hosts. That Sevaot has to do with, with the term armies. Whenever you have a biblical truth, you're going to find counterfeits in the occult and in pagan worship and in pseudo-scriptural worship. The pagans were also worshipping Sevaot, but in pagan mythology, both in the Eastern world and in the Western world, both in Babylon initially, but then later in Greece and so forth, planetary bodies and stars were associated with these hosts of heaven. Planetary bodies and stars were associated with these hosts of heaven. Now again, this is a satanically or demonically inspired counterfeit of something that's scriptural, because the scriptures use stars as figures of Abraham's descendants and in some contexts of angels. You always have a mimicking or a, a, a counterfeit trying to look like it is scriptural. However, what it came down to was Adonai Elohim Tzavaot. Lord God of the hosts. Here it is, Mirkam, Mirkam, a pagan god. This becomes the issue. It tries to look the same as what's scriptural, but it's not about Yahweh, it's about another god. Yet it has the Tzavaot, which is a, a recurrent theme in the Hebrew scriptures. This becomes a problem in the Christian church with the veneration of angels in Eastern Orthodoxy and in Roman Catholicism, certainly. But the passage I would point to, please, is turn to Colossians chapter 2, if you will. Look with me if you have a Bible handy to the book of Colossians chapter 2. Colossians is actually quite an important, well, all the epistles are important, but Colossians is important in a particular way, dealing with the vain philosophies of the world and false religion getting in to the Christian church. We read the following in Colossae. Now, when we read about Colossae, we have to remember something. The cities of Laodicea, Colossae, and Heropolis are basically within walking distance of each other, no more than two miles. I've been there many times. Colossae is not excavated yet, but Laodicea certainly is. These were not three churches. They were one church, as it were, one Christian community. Paul makes this clear when he writes to Colossae. He's writing to those who are also in Laodicea in chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, when you see Laodicea, that connects by something known as binyan ab meshte katubim connecting two passages together midrashically with the Midot to the church of Laodicea, the last church before Jesus comes. In Laodicea, in the last days, these issues are going to become a problem. The vain philosophies of the world and false religious ideas are going to infiltrate the church. But continuing on in this chapter 2, referring to the questioner's specific question about the hosts, Again, they corresponded to angelic armies. Look with me, please, to verse 16. 
Therefore, let no one just act as your judge in regard to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. But then in verse 18, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. The following false religions are all predicated on this very thing that Paul warns against, drawing on the Old Testament background of Zephaniah chapter 1 in considerable measure. Looking at the angels, the Greek word angelo or Hebrew ma'alak is the idea that they're only the messenger. Islam claims falsely that the angel Gabriel gave the Quran to Muhammad as the Third Testament. Moroni, as the Mormons call him, supposedly gave this revelation, the Books of Mormons, to Joseph Smith. It's based on the same thing. Ellen G. White, the founder of the Christian Science, I'm sorry, of the founder of the uh, Seventh-day Adventists, my apologies, founder of the Seventh-day Adventists, Ellen G. White, the same thing. She claimed an angel appeared to her and revealed these things to her. And you have various instances of things like this in Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and in certain cult movements. And also in hyper-charismatic mysticism, which they believe is, is somehow spirituality, but in, a, in the extreme axis of the charismatic movement, you have a counterfeit spirituality that is essentially mystical, and it's not uncommon to hear people claiming angelic revelations. Now, if you look in the scriptures, angels only come as messengers. They tell you something that God told them, or they seek to explain it. The angel Gabriel shows up in the book of Daniel and explains to Daniel what's going to happen. Therefore, the same angel Gabriel, who tells Daniel about the timing of the Messiah's coming in Daniel 9, shows up in the Magnificat in the infancy narratives, telling Mary, okay? That's the kind of role that angels would play in terms of not giving a revelation, but conveying the message of it, or explaining the message of it. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, said a virgin will conceive, using the Hebrew word alma, which is translated seven times in the Septuagint as parthenos, virgin, by the ancient rabbis. A virgin shall conceive. The doctrine did not come from Gabriel. In the book of Daniel, Gabriel only explained the vision that God gave Daniel. So too, in the Magnificat and in the Nativity narratives, Gabriel only explains what God had already told Isaiah. Angels come as messengers to illuminate, illuminate maybe elucidate what already has been revealed by God. Angels themselves are not the source of doctrine. Islam comes from this era. Seventh-day Adventism comes from this era. Mormonism comes from this era. And there are hyper-charismatics, Roman Catholics, and even Eastern Orthodox people caught up in similar era. Remember, Satan manifests himself as an angel of light. He's a very powerful archangel, an angelic being. And <clears throat> we're told in Corinthians, his servants do the same. Now his servants are both human, but also angelic. Fallen angels are demons. Demons are fallen angels. But they can look like angels of light to a degree, when in fact they're angels of darkness. The focus must be, is this from Yahweh? Is the revelation from Yahweh? Is the revelation from the Word of God? Is Yahweh being worshipped as a result of it? Now in the Magnificat of Mary, she prays, My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Immediately she gives worship to Yahweh. That was her response. In Zephaniah chapter 1, it was Milcom, 
a pagan god, uh, which had the bounterous things associated with the worship of Milcomi. Remember, Paul said other gods are demons. So too, in Islam, you have this veneration of Muhammad and a lifting up of the Arabian moon god, Allah, instead of Yahweh and instead of Yeshua, Jesus. Joseph Smith becomes lifted up. And the Mormon god, who the Mormons, well, many Christians don't know, identify Yahweh with Adam. And they say Adam was God who had relations with Eve. That is, man is, God was, <coughs> and as God was, or as God is, man will become. They actually believe Adam was God. Again, it points to another God. When you see the Tzavaot, the angelic armies, the angelic majesties, the hosts of heaven, venerated and looked to as a source of some doctrinal revelation, it's going to point people away from Jesus and away from the worship of the one true God, Yahweh. It's going to delude people. Now, this is what was happening in the days of Zephaniah with the Israelites. And Paul was warning the Colossians the same thing was happening in Colossae, Laodicea, and in Herapolis. Well, it's happening again today. I'm sickened, absolutely sickened, when I see the rapprochement between evangelicals and Mormons. People who I used to respect, who I never thought would do those things, people like Robbie Zacharias, speaking at Mormon temples or Mormon places of worship or Mormon conferences, without drawing the distinction between the Mormon Jesus and our Jesus. Their Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. And again, it comes from this angelic revelation that is claimed the Tzavaot, the hosts of heaven. Uh, what Z Rabbi Zacharias did, I found most distressing. Other people uh, like him, even people in Biola, uh, they were doing things that, that, that should be unthinkable. But they're certainly doing it. And again, Rabbi Zacharias was a man I once respected. I once respected that guy. I don't anymore, but I once did. Uh, it's quite sad what's happening today. Another example is Chrislam. Chrislam. Somehow identifying the God of Islam with the God of the Bible and looking for common ground with Islam. False religion always counterfeits. The Quran counterfeits the Judeo Christian scriptures. Islam elevates Muhammad to a status superior to Jesus, and denies the fundamental truths about it. Well, what is the source of Islam? Angelic revelation. Mormonism, the same. Seventh-day Adventism, the same. It was a problem in the days of Zephaniah. It was a problem in Colossae. And unfortunately, it's a problem today. It's a problem in the age of the Church of Laodicea, once again. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless.